Welcome, everybody. My name is uh, Dino Esposito, and uh, in the next hour and more, I will try to summarize uh, what is uh, new in uh, ASP.NET MVC 5. OK, the quick answer is nothing. <laughs> so if the answer is nothing, that next question is, but why on heart? You, Dino, had a book out only a few weeks ago. And why are you presenting here? But nothing is just a quick answer. Uh, to be honest, uh, there is uh, quite a few things that are interesting to look at when uh, looking at ASP.NET and DC, but more in general, ASP.NET as a platform, as a framework uh, for building web solutions uh, using the Microsoft stack. Um, today, or, or actually I think tomorrow, is the day, the first day of build the Microsoft uh, conference taking place in San Francisco. And uh, as usual in these situations, when there's build, there's take head, once there was PDC, good news, or at least news, are expected to come our way. So we will see, we'll figure out later today, tomorrow, uh, which kind of news are coming out of build. But if you are on the news, uh, uh, rumors have been around that there is some sort of future uh, VNext, there's always a VNext, right? And there's also a VNext for ASP.NET. And uh, we, we don't need to be, you know, a, a magician or uh, look into the lamp's gut to see the future to figure out that there's another buzzword that has been around, which is OWIN, Open Web Interface, or whatever it is. Um, and OWIN probably, probably, you know, it's been around the word katana, OWIN, this kind of buzzwords, they probably have a role, who knows, in the future uh, of ASP.NET. So MVC5 and the fact that there is really nothing big in this release, in this version, seems to confirm that the meat and potato, the juice, is still to come and will come with the, okay, V next, whatever it is. So regardless of age, okay, version number, uh, there is always something to learn. So the purpose, the primary purpose of this presentation is essentially telling you that what I think is the right way to approach web development using the Microsoft stack. So as a disclaimer, I already told you that there are, don't, don't expect to learn new, completely new things uh, don't expect to find brilliant, dazzling demos. Uh, the key takeaway for AVC5 is consolidation. But also, I invite you, OK, consolidation is great. There's another keyword that you may have heard frequently around the uh, latest Microsoft technologies, and it's convention-based. I don't like the term convention that much, but not because I'm a configuration kind of guy, because there is always the, 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 the um, dichotomy, convention versus configuration. I think that there are situations in which convention is good and situations in which a little bit of hard made, handmade configuration allows you to keep everything under control. You know exactly what kind of byte, the rule that every byte you write plays in the application, so that is even better. Anyway, what I see wrong, but it's my personal perspective, in using too much convention is that it leads to excessive simplification. So, and Web API is, uh, as I say, things the perfect example of it works, but you don't know why it works. And uh, in the moment in which you happen, because okay, oh, it looks like MVC, so you learned 
you know how MVC works, I mean action on controller methods, you try to do the same to create a plain stupid, get something or you use a different name, orders, instead of get orders, and it doesn't work. And you can hardly figure out why, because it's convention. Because there is a convention built in the framework, Web API in particular, that it's not, because it's conventional, you are assumed to know it, but you don't know it, because it's not clearly documented. Anyway, so this is the story, and beware of excessive simplification, because a simplification killed the cat. I have a dog called <laughs> no. simplification. Now, the ASP.NET of things. Oh, this is another buzzword, Internet of Things. Okay, the ASP of Net of Things. Where is the real value uh, from the perspective of MVC5? Uh, um, well, one ASP .NET. It means that the future, I mean, the, the, the term one ASP .NET seems to indicate that the future is to have just one. ASP.NET platform, or at least that the perspective of developers writing applications has to be the perspective of writing one web app using which internal framework, whether MVC, web forms, web API, that is a second step. That is a kind of detail. It is part of the scaffolding. Another change is change. Another feature that is any, in some way relevant is the use of Bootstrap. Now, Bootstrap is, has nothing to do with MVC, so Bootstrap is not part of MVC. Bootstrap is a plain CSS library, so it, it, it's a combination of a CSS file plus some JavaScript files to produce what? To produce uh, animation, life, interactivity, a responsiveness to HTML pages. So it's just a way to style pages. Uh, is Bootstrap important? We'll see, we'll find out later. Uh, but uh, just to invite you not to, to not undervalue Bootstrap, but not even to overvalue it, Consider that when Microsoft uh, a year and a half ago released MVC4, the role that today Bootstrap plays was played by jQuery Mobile. So a year and a half ago, it seemed like jQuery Mobile was going to be the, the future. Everybody was going to, to, to write mobile sites and so forth. So Bootstrap is just the next. But compared to jQuery Mobile, Bootstrap really seems to be the winner it's not perfect, but it seems to be anyway the winner or one of the most serious candidate to become a, a sort of de facto standard when it comes to uh, using CSS to styling uh, the HTML language. Identity, ASP.NET identity, that's another one. And probably in terms of technology, that's the biggest one in MVC5. It's yet another framework, and <laughs> yet another is not exactly a po very positive statement is yet another membership API. We had uh, from ASP.NET 2.0 10 years ago. Wow, 10 years ago, no, nine years ago, 2005. We had uh, the membership API, uh, which at some point resulted to be too complicated, over complex. So we had a simple membership that shipped at some point with uh, uh, web pages, uh, it was also incorporated in MVC4. Today there's another one, identity. It's yet another. So we're still talking about an API for membership. Uh, better uh, identity that is expected to become uh, the standard. So this is the primary reason for you to look into that. Uh, and then there are a few more minor technicalities uh, like attribute routing and enums in uh, editors. Display modes. So trying to categorize the, the list of the MVC of things. Uh, one ASP.NET scaffolding and bootstrap, they belong to the ASP.NET identity. So they are changes 
they are sold as changes to NBC5, but in reality, they touch the entire framework, uh, the platform, ASP.NET as a platform. In red, NVC5, so identity and a few more uh, minor technicalities, belong, strictly belong, are new to NVC5. And finally, display modes is a feature that was already in NVC4. So it's nothing new. It didn't get any update in NVC5, but I still believe that is the most important and undervalued neglected feature we have today. It's the coolest feature we have today in NBC as a whole. And this, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sad that Microsoft doesn't seem to give enough relevance to the feature called display modes. I will be giving you a huge demo of that. So, one ASP.NET, no more friendly fire. <laughs> so, the goal, thanks God, is to, okay, we have just one platform. Good, bad, it doesn't matter. This is what we have, but it's one. So, the story, web form versus MVC, the role of web API, hopefully this kind of story will disappear and we should expect to have a more precise news on this particular point from build, and if not from build, from take ad next month. So hopefully we will see no more religion wars and friendly fire in the realm of ASP.NET. So a brotherhood of all ASP.NET frameworks. Web forms and in red, NVC Web API in blue. Again, this is a just my personal guess. If I were Microsoft, and which I'm not, uh, I would consider strictly separating red from blue. So, again, it's my guess, but uh, NVC and Web API have uh, a lot in common. I mean, as far as the public interface is concerned, right? Because in terms of the, underneath, the framework and the runtime, the commonality exists between today, between web forms and NVC. So these two guys run on the, share the same runtime environment, which is tightly coupled to IAS. Web API is different. It has its own runtime, which is and will be even more in the future all win based, so loose and loosely coupled to IIS and uh, easy to couple with uh, any other host environment that exposes and understands an all win interface. But NDC and Web API share the same approach to programming. So both are based on controllers both reasons in terms of actions on controllers, both fully support the routing, and reason in terms of actions instead of pages. So today, the, 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 the source, the origin of friendly fire and religion wars is that there is a mix because web forms and NVC share the same runtime, but NVC and web API share the same programming interface. And everything is different. So the, you, you, uniting, unifying this world, or at least reducing three blocks to two blocks, that's the final purpose. That, that is the big change that in perspective is important. So if you understand these mechanics, that's important for you because uh, it should suggest you in which is the ideal approach to take in your particular scenarios. My understanding is that web forms is going to be left alone, tightly coupled to IIS as it is today, no extra features. If you like it, if you find it worthwhile, if you have skills and, and code in your organization that is heavily based on web forms, fine. Don't expect to find new brilliant server controls from vendors or from Microsoft, 
What you have today is what you will have for the foreseeable future, and that's it. If it works for you today, it will work for you tomorrow. But web forms is essentially a platform device for using server controls and for not leveraging HTML and JavaScript. Because web forms was devised 15 years ago at a time in which the purpose of the designer, the people demand, was we want to write web applications. We don't want to use HTML and JavaScript. Today, it's completely the opposite. And that's why NBC was created back in 2007. The future seems to go in the direction of full control over HTML and CSS and uh, decoupling that takes place at all levels of the stack. So NBC and Web API on top of OWIN is my personal vision of the future of the Microsoft Web Platform. Imagine the new world. Imagine leads to John Lennon. I'm not good at talking. I was thinking of, for a moment, to use some uh, karaoke here. That's not good. Uh, I could have arranged something with Roy Oshrov. But I invite you just to imagine the future. This is a good time for imagining the future of the ASP.NET platform. And it's important because uh, imagine there's not, not, not .NET. Imagine, you know, it's scary, no doubt below us, above us only cloud, Ugh. and all developers coding for Win8. You may say I'm a dreamer, <laughs> but I'm not the only one. <laughs> and uh, I hope someday they'll get it, and ASP.NET will be just one. So, pick the framework you like. This is the screen, this is a dialog box that you find in a Visual Studio 2013 when you try to create a new web project. So before you get this screen, there's another one, the classic choose a project type window from Visual Studio. And uh, there you have, I think I can show you that. And here, you find uh, Web, under web, there is only one project type. This is the true meaning of one ASP.NET. Just build an ASP.NET web application. And when you select this one, you move next and you face, you will be served this dialog box with the option of choosing empty web forms, MVC, web API. OK, forget about the others. And uh, more importantly, you have the option to add. Okay, you can choose already a predefined template, or you can create your own combination of templates. So in other words, if you are you know, a serious developer, developer that doesn't want to hear about conventions, if you are a configuration kind of developer, you want to start from an empty project, don't give me all the crap of predefined templates that basically reference everything in the world, and you spend most of the time to get rid of unwanted references and unwanted packages. Okay, start from an empty, just empty project. But before Visual Studio 2013 and NDC 5, even choosing the empty project, you had to, I mean, to choose empty, but an empty MVC or an empty web forms or an empty web API. Today, you choose empty. And you can then add folders and core references for each of the flavors you like, even combining these two together. Okay, it's not a feature you get specifically from MVC5, but the combination, MVC, latest MVC and latest Visual Studio, makes extremely easy and powerful the dream 
of the, that I heard from developers in the past five or six years, how can I mix together web forms and MVC? Today, it is as easy as checking both things here. So mix web forms and MVC with no effort. Add web API if you need it with a simple click. And uh, underneath uh, all of the folders, core references, whatever changes to web config, whatever needs to happen to fully support the special flavor of ASP.NET you like, that happens under the hood. This is where I, I get to love. <coughs> Convention things, things that happen magically. MVC and web forms are absolutely safe to work together, at least for the time being. They are absolutely guaranteed to work together because they share that same runtime environment. It's the same. Uh, the only, if you look at you know, the technicalities, the only difference between MVC and web forms is that at some point in the pipeline that each request goes through, there is an, a sort of router that looks into the URL, runs the URL through the routing, the list of routes you write yourself as part of your app. If there's a match, it goes to a controller. If there's no match, it goes through the regular pipeline. So if it is an ISPX request, it goes through web form and it is being served as usual. So up until, uh, up before, before this came, the simplest way was building, to mix the two things together, was building an MVC app and then just adding ASPX references, pages. That was it. And of course you could make pages navigate to each other just using the link, hyperlink mechanism. Today is uh, a little bit easier. Oh, scaffolding. Uh, uh, the list of the bullet points uh, that I'm presenting now uh, come from uh, official white papers official content of pages you find on the ASP.NET website. So scaffolding is presented as one of the great things in MVC5. It depends. There is good, good parts, there are good parts and not so good parts in uh, scaffolding as I personally see it. The good parts are that scaffolding makes uh, quick and easy to arrange a CRUD. Now, are you writing crude? Give me your definition of a crude. Because every system, to some extent, is a crude. And every, uh, 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 this is one way of looking at that. Another way is the opposite. It says no system is as stupidly simple. No real world, no, no, no line of business. And by line of business, I mean a system used to run a business. Application is as stupidly simple as a crude. But on the other end, and in my classes, I often say, are you really writing a music store in your company? Do you run a music store or a pet store application in your organization? Everybody, everybody says, no, you kid. Yes, but if you take uh, the raw logic of a music store stupid application and uh, you just add a little bit of you know business logic on top of that it could be as simple as a strong validation logic so that you add a pet only if the pet is really alive or has a name that adds you know a layer of business logic on top of crude so if you have a, a basic fundamental crude plus some business logic, I'm not so sure that you won't find examples of these apps used to run businesses in the wild. 
So crude is, you know, it's not immediately obvious what a crude is. So it depends on, so which, if scaffolding is good or not, also depends on your personal definition of what a crude is. So what, let's try now to, to take a, a wider, a broader perspective on things. Uh, okay, it's easy to arrange a crude because you click a button and you get controllers automatically generated with a few methods just to run to uh, support the basic create, read, qu query, uh, delete, and update operations. What you get from the ASP.NET scaffolding, however, is only controllers and repositories. So controllers to orchestrate the business logic, if you have any, and the repositories to deal with uh, physical data access. It basically, in repositories, is where are, there are classes, typically bound to controllers. So if you have an order controller, you're going to have an order repository. And in the order repository, you're going to have any code that deals with entity framework, or ADO.NET, or an Ibernate, or this or that, or RavenDB, whatever it is. Outside the repositories, you are expected not to have any reference to connection to things like connection strings, SQL queries, and so forth. The not so good parts are that in a In a, in, a, in a realistic system. And realistic doesn't mean complex. Doesn't necessarily mean complex. Realistic is uh, used in the real world. In any realistic system, the vision one model, one class, describes everything. I have books. I have uh, music. I have... Uh, or one class to describe one model, the one model vision is unrealistic. It's too simplistic. It doesn't work. Or, worse yet, you can make it work, but at which cost? The cost of creating a convoluted code, a mess, a big ball of mud. So, when you find in ASP.NET NVC a project folder called models, it's not necessarily the place where you are going to have classes taken from entity framework, inferred from entity framework. So it's, um, it's fundamental that for uh, taking projects home with the least possible amount of effort, you start reasoning in terms of potentially three distinct types of models. The input model, what you get from the forms. Uh, the input form is the list of parameters that a controller method receives. It could be just a plain list of strings, integer, whatever, or it could be wrapped up in a single all-encompassing object. Using the model binding mechanism, it's fine. So that's the input. Those classes form the input model. Then there is the view model, which is what you receive from uh, the orchestration of workflows bound to each request. The data you need to serve back pages to the user. Those are the classes or the data in general you pass to the view method you call at the end of each controller method. In between, there should be the domain model, where you represent the data from the perspective of the business. Now, it could be that the three models coincide. It could be. It could be. I'm not saying it shouldn't. It has to be seen if, it were, if the three coincides or not. If they coincide, fine, happy. Happy the project who can use just one type of model. But missing the point that in general, there are three distinct models. 
That's bad. That's the not so good part. And finally, there's another point that architecturally speaking, I see missing entirely from the ASP.NET and Microsoft vision of things. It's the application layer. And then there's a sort of random question that pops up. But is application layer really a concept for beginners? And because I, I see no clue of application layer in the scaffolding, because the application layer sits in between controllers and repositories. If this concept is completely missing, what does it mean? Is it missing because uh, it's too complicated to advance? For beginners, and who are beginners? My son, 15 years old, can be considered a beginner when he does programming. But if you work, if you build applications, if you are hired and paid to build applications, you're not a beginner. I mean, not the same as a child, as a student can be. So the application layer is no rocket science. It's simply the notion that there should be something, an extra layer interfacing controllers and data access. Now, we, we, we can take it further and discuss what if something has to live in between application layer and repositories. But at the very, uh, the, 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 the key thing is, we blame the developers, and as developers, we blame each other in the past for creating end-to-end -end procedures in both button one click. Okay, how many times we, we did that in web forms? Click the button, okay, there's a function called button one click, and we put everything there. Opening connections, close connections, run this, run that. Now, this is the most horrible way of writing code. And today, we do the same within controllers. It's exactly the same. Logically speaking, architecturally speaking, a controller method is the same as button one click. It's the same. It's presentation layer. So adding a repository to, delegate, to take some work out of the controller and into a separate class is, OK, it, it's a due step. But it's not enough, probably. And we need something more in that, uh, that usually is called the application layer. It's the application logic. Uh, the application logic is the implementation of the use cases of the, the, of the screens. So if there is a command in a screen that is being sent against the back end of the application, that is a command. This command that represents a use case or a way for the user to interact with the system. So we need to have a piece of code that gets the command and dispatches the command to something else in the back end. Uh, it could simply put down like uh, the application layer orchestrates the action, the workflow that follows a simple action. Uh, let's imagine a common scenario like an online store. Right? So imagine a form where you make an order. You add products to your shopping cart. At some point, you click the button, submit, and you want the order, an order to be created in the back end of the application. But creating the order, or whatever it means creating an order in the back end of your business system, is not as stupidly simple as just add a new record to the order table and a bunch of new records to the order details table. There is a workflow if you have a little bit of business logic, okay, there is a workflow. And at the very, you know, the simplest case I can think of, the workflow is about checking the availability of goods being ordered. Do we have these goods in stock? Can we serve the order? Yes, no. Checking the payment history of the customer. Do we really want to deliver goods to this customer? What's the, the payment history 
Do we trust this customer? Yes, no? And maybe things more advanced like, uh, okay, we can serve the order, we can trust the customer, but by serving the order, we may run short of goods in stock. So we probably need to refill stock. And then, okay, further steps could be synchronization between uh, our backhand and the backhand of the, the company managing the shipment. Payment, possibly going through an, a back-to-back -back interaction with Visa, MasterCard, or whatever, PayPal, whatever it is. So there's a workflow at the end of which we probably create a bunch of records in a bunch of tables. So this workflow, the orchestration of this workflow, where does it go? Is it a repository? No, because repository should have one responsibility, just doing data access. OK, fine. Is it the controller? It could be. The, it's the controller is much better than the repository. But if it's the controller, we are back to the scenario we blamed for years, orchestrating all tasks from within the presentation layer. So ideally, we need something in the middle, something in between. And it's the, okay, the presentation calls into one entry point, well-defined, clear entry point in the application layer. And the application layer does the orchestration. And in doing so, it calls into repositories for physical data access. And the application layer is the only place that knows about input and view model. Because methods in the application layer, they receive input model classes what we get directly from the controller, and return back to the controller view model classes ready to be passed to the view method and translated via Razor into HTML pages. And at the same time, the application layer for business-related tasks, it may know about also the domain model if you have one. So this is essentially the overall architecture that is can be considered the state of the art. Today, it's called the layered architecture. There's also you know, a pattern, the layered architecture pattern. It's uh, deeply inspired by domain-driven design approach, but essentially it, it, it's just you know, the next step following the classic three-tier architecture, presentation, business, and data access. We have the presentation and if we are considering an AMVC app, in the presentation layer we have controllers. Then we controllers call directly and exclusively into the application layer, into classes. And the simplest way for arranging an application layer is creating a class for each controller. If you have order, you're going to have an order application service. If you have customer controller, customer application service and the naming convention is also up to you. The application layer orchestrates uh, whatever your backend is. And now, this vision here it introduces a domain layer. So this is an architecture, a version of the architecture, highly inspired by domain-driven design that says that essentially your logic is expressed in terms of a model made of classes, uh, exactly what code first seems to, you know, to transmit, and services, because the model, we want it to be completely persistence ignorant, so agnostic to whatever is persistence, but in some place, we need to have a code that loads customers and orders from the database and saves those graphs back. So this is where domain services fit, and domain services also have access and orchestrate calls to repositories and also maybe cross-cutting concerns, most typically caching. Uh, if you have some uh, IOC logic, okay, that it could be used as part of the infrastructure from both model and services. So this is an architecture, the modern, the most modern, the, the, the state-of-the-art architecture that at various level of detail can be and must be implemented also and especially from within ASP.NET MVC, but there is no clue of this in uh, the vision of MVC because the vision you have is exactly this. Application layer, domain layer completely disappear from the controller. You jump 
straight into repositories. This is what you are suggested to do. Be, okay, it could be right, okay? In a, there might be projects where this is exactly what you need. Fine. But my point is just be aware that you, in this way, you are only looking into a small segment of the entire picture. Twitter, bootstrap. <clears throat> okay, gut feeling. Uh, bootstrap is a, a CSS and a combination of CSS and uh, JavaScript files. Uh, the project is supported by Twitter. And uh, Bootstrap is used on Twitter websites. Um, there are many ways to look at Bootstrap, pros and cons. Um, now, it's perfect, just perfect, fantastic for quick projects. Quick projects means simply quick. There is no notion of complexity associated with quick. Okay? So, uh, by quick projects, I specifically mean those things that in some enterprises uh, relate to creating a quick website that has to be done as quickly as possible, but it could even be, you know, a sophisticated website. It takes maybe a week of work and needs to stay there. So you don't have, it's not a huge immense project in which you, you can afford the services of a great team of designers. Still you don't want to deliver because there will be users working with that website that, you know, the developer oriented user interface that we saw so many times. We don't want to give a data grid there. You want to arrange something nice without spending money and time. In this scenario, Bootstrap is just perfect. It gives you uh, pages that provide a decent, even nice view, even from different devices, because there is a bit of responsiveness, responsiveness built into the framework with the lowest possible cost. But at the same time, all sites may look the same. Yeah, you, you can buy or you can create different teams, so different combination of colors and sizes and fonts, but the structure of the site remains the same. So it's great, perfect, for small sites, public or, or private, it doesn't matter, but for quick projects. So using Bootstrap uh, doesn't remove the need of having great, well done, professional design where you have the budget and the need for that. And more importantly, Bootstrap, uh, which comes with its own user experience. Uh, UI, UX, they are not the same thing. UI is purely aesthetics. UX is aesthetics and how you use the elements in the page. So it's about the workflow that the user faces when he works, when she works with your site. So Bootstrap doesn't even remove the need of a great foretaught when it comes to user experience. And more importantly, don't forget this point, all devices are not the same. A tablet is not a smartphone. It's not the same. Mo mobile means nothing. Mobile is nothing. It's just a way to differentiate from desktop. But under the umbrella of mobile, you find tablets, mini tablets, smartphones. Xbox, large screens. So it's devices, and devices are different. And users, when perform an action on a device, may expect to have to go through a different user experience. With Bootstrap, 
if you can use uh, in the best possible way the responsive capabilities, you can probably create uh, a nice UI for each device, but not a nice UX for each device. To provide a great UX for each device, you have to put your hands and recreate the experience recreate workflows for tablets, smartphones, whatever it is that your particular app needs. And in this context, display modes play a fundamental role. That will be the last demo of this, of this presentation. The good parts of Bootstrap, it's the herald of responsive web design. So it provides natively, so you have classes built in Bootstrap to adjust to a good extent the appearance of your pages on multiple resolutions. Look, multiple resolutions, not multiple devices. It's different. Uh, again, personally, I used and I still use responsive web design in some projects. But uh, um, I see, I think I see the limitations, inherent limitations, of responsive web design, which is another point that Microsoft is not getting at all. Um, Multi-resolution. So if uh, you target a user interface to fit nicely into, say, 800 wide screen, you can think that, you know, it shows nicely on a tablet. But uh, what you are really achieving in this way with responsive web design is a design that shows nicely whenever you have 800 pixel. But it doesn't tell you if it's really a tablet or if it's a desktop window, browser window resized to be 800 pixels. So the question is, do I really need to know the type, not, not the specific, just the class of the device I'm running on? Yes, no. If no, response to everything is more than fine. If the answer is yes, and if you answer yes, it means that you are interested to provide a specific user experience to users on that particular device, Responsive web design is not for you. Or at least, it needs more. It cannot be the only answer. So again, by looking only exclusively into responsive web design, whether through the lens of Bootstrap or natively, because we're talking about CSS actually, you are again viewing only a small segment of the big entire picture. Uh, what is, uh, ah, and of course, Twitter, Twitter, the author, the company behind Bootstrap, doesn't use Bootstrap on their mobile websites for the various classes of devices. Uh, Google for that, they don't use it. They, they use Bootstrap so that when you navigate to a Twitter site from your, your desktop and you happen to resize the window, well, it shows nicely. But if you go on Twitter using a, a tablet or a smartphone, you get a completely different user experience. So new use cases, different use cases, and of course, a different UI. So Twitter doesn't use Bootstrap to create their own device-specific uh, websites. What is uh, good about Bootstrap is that it provides a taxonomy <clears throat> of web elements that are common on websites today. Uh, they are customizable and also easy to learn and use. So let me show you the home page of Bootstrap. Okay, uh, 
Oh, I'm not connected to the, oh my God. Okay, doesn't matter. This is enough. Uh, the list of names you can probably read here. Uh, glyph icons, drop downs, button groups, button drop downs, input groups, navs, nav bars, breadcrumbs, pagination, labels, badges, jumbotron, page header, thumbnails, blah, 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 blah. There's a long list, and there's a way more. Uh, examples could be, could be this, functions like this, okay? Which, this is a button drop down. So to get any of those things, and you know, the list is a subset. There are also dialog, modal dialog boxes, for example, tabs, accordions, and more and more. Uh, auto, um, auto completion, tooltips, popovers, about 50 different aggregation of HTML elements ready to use at the cost of creating an HTML structure that for the most part is a, a list of items, a UL, LI elements, and then applying a style. And that will magically turn into a nice UI like, for example, this. This is a taxonomy of new elements. So HTML is based on table, div, UL, LI, input. The base ground, even if we HTML5, we don't have that many new uh, semantically relevant elements. With Bootstrap, you have a new language on top of the core HTML. So when you choose Bootstrap, in a way, is uh, much the same way when you use jQuery and call it JavaScript. It's something on top of. Uh, OK, there are also some parts in Bootstrap that are not so good. In particular, OK, it's just the, 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 the strong point, it's a higher level than plain HTML, can also be turned to be a wake point because it overrides the core HTML semantic, which is true. So if you read the plain HTML, you see ULLI, a list uh, with a class, and you will find no, nowhere in your displayed HTML anything that can remind you of a, a, a list of items. The presentation is uh, no longer separated from content. From the perspective of web designers, this is also a concern. And more and worse yet is an all or nothing. Realistically, is an all or nothing approach. So this means that if you have a project and you are using Bootstrap there, and you jump new people onto new 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 designers, graphical people onto this project, they must go and must reason by must they must play by the rules of Bootstrap. And this can create issues and friction. Because uh, the perspective that designers tend to have of Bootstrap is uh, this is a tool that is limiting my creativity. But on the other end, it's great for developers. Because for us developers, okay, it would be the graphics is just colors. We don't care. It's just, okay, tell me which class I have to use, period. But developers, th the point is not how we color buttons. But uh, can I have a drop down button for free? So, you, graphical designer, are you in the condition of giving me a button drop down for free? Oh, no. I can give you the colors and the style of the drop downs, but then making the menu. Popping down is your developer work. And at that point, there's friction. Because Bootstrap gives you uh, pre-aggregated components styled nicely and working. Zero cost for developers. Designers uh, can be more creative 
but still require that you do the connection work yourself. So using or not bootstrap is not an easy decision and I would place it at the level of architectural decisions of those things that are really hard to change later. Uh, also consider that Twitter full size is over 100K of CSS plus over 30K uh, jizit and minified of script. Of course, full size, because Bootstrap is modular, so you may not download everything. Um, also, uh, pushing Bootstrap as, the, way, as the, the framework to go, also, in my opinion, seems to transmit the message that responsive web design, because Twitter Bootstrap is the herald, of responsive web design is anything you need anytime on any device. Uh, more recently, Ratchet 2 is a, a flavor of Bootstrap for mobile websites. So if you want to now take the route of providing a different UX, OK, you can use Ratchet 2. The website is uh, goratchet2.com, which follows the same logic of Bootstrap, but provides a UI that is very similar to iPhone and Android, so, and, and provides controls that are better, that fit much better into the context of smartphones and tablets. ASP.NET identity. Uh, I don't spend much time here because I have a, new, a talk tomorrow morning 9.30, specifically on ASP.NET Identity. But uh, in short, it's yet another membership API that probably will unify the whole topic of membership. Um, so membership, simple membership, identity, today is just pick one. But in the future, uh, identity will be the way to go. Uh, it's not specific of MVC because you can use it also in web forms if you like. It's still in progress. Uh, when I first wrote these slides in February, there was only ASP.NET 1. Uh, last week was released ASP.NET Identity 2. So it's, it's a work in progress, <laughs> like everything else these days. And here is um, <clears throat> an idea of how it works. Uh, so imagine you have a, your, uh, a controller that manages Logins to your site, I've called identity controller, uh, which inherits from controller. But um, uh, to support identity, your controller class must be injected a couple of types, T user and T DB context. I'm using the mechanism of generics here. Uh, where T user must be a class based on identity user, which is a framework provided class. And uh, T DB context must be a type uh, that inherits from identity DB context, which is another framework provided type. So T user represents the shape of the user to be saved. So what does it mean a user to you? This is an interesting difference with uh, membership. Because there you were forced to take the schema of a user that was uh, decided by the framework. And to change that, you had to create your own, from scratch, your own membership provider. Uh, here, instead, you can take the same infrastructure and just change the type that represents your user and your roles and whatever are the claims you support. Uh, for persistence, again, in the classic membership, uh, you, you, you could save to Oracle to a, a SQL Server table with a different non-default schema, but you had to create your own uh, provider from scratch. Here, instead, you maintain the framework and just provide a DB context, uh, just inject a manager that takes care of storing data. So uh, in the end, uh, the constructor of identity controller just uh, calls the, the base class and passes uh, an instance of a user manager framework class 
of T user and user manager is injected user store of T user which in turn is injected the DB context. Wow. Uh, okay, you need to tell essentially the framework what is your user and how you intend to save it. This passes through two, two classes you have to write, period. <laughs> if you want to customize things. If you don't want to customize things, uh, okay, uh, entity framework will be the layer and will create a database according to its own basic definition of a user. So this is what you need to do if you want to customize things. Use this code skeleton and uh, just create your own implementation of T-user and T-DB context. Uh, tomorrow, in, uh, in the talk specifically dedicated to identity, I will show you uh, how you can use, you can create a custom DB context using RavenDB. So a NoSQL uh, database uh, for storage. Uh, because uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, points uh, here is that internally, uh, identity uses entity framework uh, to persist any user's code first. So it takes your definition of a user and then uh, infers from that the structure of the database. It creates the database on first run and keeps on saving data. The moment in which you decide, probably during development anyway, to modify the structure of the user, you need to go through the migration, blah, 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 wizard for code and so forth. If you use RavenDB, you don't have this problem. You can just version uh, your classes and keep on saving data without changing anything. So this is one of the scenarios that um, identity uh, makes possible using a NoSQL document database just for storing user information uh, without the need of, you know, so you, you can have the claims that this is one of the benefits at any time to your users uh, without uh, having to, uh, to put your hands on the database. Uh, another point to notice here is uh, authentication manager. Essentially, when you work with an identity membership system, uh, the two basic operations is sign in and sign out of users. Uh, which in ASP.NET for years uh, consisted in creating an authentication cookie which was then added to each and every subsequent request, checked to generate a principle, blah, blah, blah. Okay, it's the same here, except that there is no, nothing like forms authentication, super class, but everything is wrapped up in the all-way context, so with this simple call, Coming. This get all win contact is an extension method provided by the identity framework. And uh, authentication here returns an object behind this uh, facade interface that knows how to log in and log out users. And it does that simply creating uh, cookies. And there are also other ways in which this can be tracked. But we will see details of this uh, tomorrow. Um, yeah. Other features. Um, attribute routing and uh, enum support in, uh, in views. Uh, attribute routing uh, is, uh, <coughs> it has to do with uh, how you define routes for controller methods. Now in, uh, in uh, ASP.NET MVC since the beginning, we had a, a, a piece of code put in code from a globalized X, from application start in globalized X, where we were defining in, so in one single place all of the routes that were supported by our application. And uh, the system was then for each incoming call was looking into the list of registered routes. So the registered valid URL templates, okay, that our app was going to support and recognize and until a, a match was found. So this URL looks like matches this template, okay? So if a match could be found, okay, then 
controller to invoke and action to call on the controller class were figured out using the rules of the route. The point was that we had routes all in a single place and probably worse yet in a given order. So if you were if you write a crew, if you write a music score, you don't see the problem. Uh, if you write uh, a moderately complex application, you don't see the problem. But if you create a rest intensive application, uh, when, 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 in general, when you happen to have uh, hundreds, even less than hundreds, dozens of different routes, it could be problematic. Just finding out the right order of some of them. Because at that point, it's not guaranteed at all that, you know, that the, the URL you think of is effectively matched to the right template because there might be another template added before it that still makes the match. So the more the number of routes to be handled grows, the more you risk to lose control of how road matching actually happens. And this is a problem. This could be a problem for ensuring the ads here. So um, attribute routing is uh, an approach that was already introduced, also works for Web API too, that attempts to fix this problem. <clears throat> so the, the point is, uh, take a route out of the global route collection repository and uh, just uh, attach route information as an attribute to the specific controller method. So, which means that this method is going to call only if the URL matches this template. It's uh, in a way similar to what we did in WCF, if you remember that, when Microsoft added HTTP simplified support to WCF. We had the URL template or something like that, where we, through the web get and web post attributes. It, it's the same kind of thing. Just brought back into ABC and web API. Uh, the good news is that you can still go both ways. So you are not forced to decorate every single controller method with uh, a particular route. You can still maintain the central repository of routes as you have done for years now, and then you can use the attribute to decorate specific methods, and the controller method attribute takes precedence over the general algorithm. So, uh, in register routes, the, where you define your uh, general repository of uh, routes, uh, there is uh, an extra line to be added which is called uh, map MDC attribute routes, which enables support for uh, uh, route attributes on controller methods. Everything else is as usual, so you can have here a long list of map route calls to define, to add to a dictionary of routes, all of the general rules in the order that you need. In action, uh, we have here the route attribute on, uh, on the edit method, uh, which means that, uh, suppose that the controller is called books, books slash edit slash id, which would be the classic uh, URL to invoke this method, doesn't work. Read, and the only way you have to call the edit method from the outside via URL is essentially in this, in this demo just switching ID and edit. Make sense? Uh, of course, uh, a curly bracket, wrap, parameter names uh, exactly the same way. So ID you find uh, here must match. So if you use any parameter between curly brackets, the name here must match the name in the command line of the method. And if uh, 
uh, model binding is used here and you have a, a, a class, then the match must occur between uh, the name here and one public property on the class uh, that you may happen to use here instead of that primitive one. Um, okay. Uh, book editor in this case is just uh, the name you assign to the root uh, if you want to, and you can use that name in much the same way you use the road names uh, from the global repository to, to do redirection, for example, the particular road, <coughs> identifying the road name. Just an extra attribute. Uh, road prefix uh, uh, indicates uh, that the prefix specified should be added to all of the routes you find defined within the body of the controller class. So to call edit, we still need to go through books slash id slash edit. Uh, if you don't want to do that, if you want to override the prefix, you use the tilde. So by default, if you use wrong prefix at the controller class level, that prefix would be used by default for all methods that in the class show a route attribute, except that the route begins with the tilde. In this case, the prefix is ignored. So to call live edit, you just do server slash book editor slash id. <coughs> um, more examples. Uh, the route with uh, this nice uh, syntax uh, in curly brackets action equals something. Uh, that means that by default for uh, this controller class the action is always the name specified here. So it's just like having the action name attribute of NBC automatically assigned to all of the action methods on the controller. So edit here is not the name of the action. The name of the action is the index. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, okay, not exactly. Um, action index is uh, applies to all actions unless a specific route. Sorry, is specified. So for edit, it still goes id slash edit, and the action is edit. But if, if there, there were more methods in this controller class so without devoid of the route attribute, for those, by default, the action would have been in. Uh, you can also use uh, uh, constraints on parameters. So you can, in this example in particular, you can indicate that the id parameter here must be an integer. You can do even more, like in this case, it has to be an integer and uh, at least 1,000. Uh, if books is called with a string or an integer which is uh, smaller than 1,000, just the, the, the route simply doesn't match, and this may result in a 404. Uh, here is uh, the list of supported constraints. So alpha for it has to be alphabetic, integer, and then there is a long list of numbers, so long as uint or whatever, decimal and so forth. It has to be a GUID, max length, min or max. A date, it has to be a date time, a boolean. It has to be a number falling in the specified range, or it must comply with the specified regular expression. Uh, the supported constraints uh, are essentially more or less the same list of constraints you could even support uh, in the row collection, traditional way of defining them. Okay, if you want something more, if you just want to apply your custom logic, uh, you can still write a class that implements iRoute constraint. And that is nothing new, because the iRoute constraint has been there since the very first early days of ABC to write custom constraints to apply new routes. Uh, what, so you can, if, you, if you need to, to have a custom 
validator for parameters, you know, routing right anyway, the first step is writing an implementation of I route constraint. Then the additional step that is specifically required by attribute routing is that you need to have a resolver and add the extra constraint to its map. So essentially you need to, the, the, the fundamental point is you need to essentially add an item to this internal map list so that the resolver of URLs knows about that. Uh, a resolver, uh, probably there is no reason for not using this class which is predefined part of the framework, uh, default inline constraint resolver. So you need to have this code, constraint map add, the type of your custom constraint class, and this is the name that should be added at this level. So the name, the syntax that you want to be used here, the custom name to be used here to trigger your custom validation logic for routes. And you place this code typically within uh, register routes in the global index. Uh, another small change, long awaited, is finally, thanks God, support for enums in uh, um, HTML editors in Razor. So in Razor, you can use uh, the HTML editor for helper, which automatically builds up um, a form with uh, editors for all of the public types of the public members of the type you pass in. So if you have a customer, say a customer type you, you pass as a part of the view model down to a razor view. HTML editor for the customer instance will create a, a table-based UI where you have a, a property name equals and the editor for the corresponding type. So you have an editor automatically created. Um, data annotations, you can use attributes for data annotations you can use on the members of the class for which you call the HTML editor for uh, can help you to uh, change and customize uh, part of the Razor uh, HTML UI. But up until now, the big pain in the proverbial rear end was uh, what to do with enums. Because if the class the customer had a property, I don't know, state, enabled, disabled, or whatever it is, uh, there was no easy way, no automatic way to have uh, the editor for the corresponding type whose for the property uh, whose type was an enum to have a, a drop down with the list of valid values for that particular type. Uh, this is now possible uh, and uh, enum drop down list for is the new function. You can use, that will be automatically used within editor for but you can also use that specifically for uh, a list of options. Um, if you want to know the list <coughs> as a collection of the items being displayed in the drop down, you call enum helper get select list. And uh, this is how, these are two examples of enums. In this particular case, the drop down will contain exactly these strings. And uh, it's about readability. Because, uh, okay, zero, one, two, four, eight, whatever, are, you know, expressed in one language, and they must be a single word. No blanks are allowed. If you want to customize the way in which the value zero, one, and whatever are displayed in the drop-down, you take this approach, you use the display data annotation, to indicate the text, and uh, the example here, you display French names for numeric values of the e button. Now, um, I had this code 
working in a personal library for years now, I used the description attribute instead of the display uh, attribute. Uh, um, and I also have in my personal library added myself support for localization. So my description attribute extended also allow, has a, 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 an overload here that allows you to indicate the entry, the resource name that gets a name uh, uh, localized to the particular language. So as far as I know, uh, in NDC5, you can use a display attribute over here, uh, but for uh, localization support, uh, you, you must derive your own attribute and just your own display class and add an extra constructor that points simply to the to an entry in your resources. And finally, display modes. Now, display modes have been there since NDC4. And as, in my opinion, they are the most neglected feature of the entire ASP.NET platform. Essentially, they are view switcher. Conceptually, they are the same as CSS media queries. CSS media queries are a browser feature that define a Boolean expression. The browser evaluates the Boolean expression. If the Boolean expression returns true, the browser picks up a particular CSS and applies that CSS to the page. If the Boolean expression returns false, the browser goes, proceeds to the next CSS media query until it finds a match. When a match is found, a CSS, the corresponding CSS is applied. If no match is found, no CSS, no conditional CSS is applied. This is how it works in CSS media queries, which is at the foundation of responsive web design. Now, Display modes allow you to implement uh, something we can call HTML view query. The difference is that instead of picking up a CSS file, we pick up a razor view. Based on which conditions? Based on a Boolean condition. But now the Boolean condition is evaluated, the expression is evaluated on the server side, and you write it. So CSS media query is evaluated outside your control by the browser and it depends on the few properties, so the, what you can put in the Boolean expression. You can only put values defined by the CSS media query standard, which includes five properties at all. The next version has 10 properties, but nothing really serious. The most important property you can work on remains the width of the screen. Also, the orientation is the second most important property. Everything has colors, just don't matter. In uh, display modes, the condition is evaluated on the server side, and you put the logic in. So it allows you to do things like, uh, OK, your controller method index returns view index. Okay? So index is the name of the view for which you expect to find under the views folder index.cshtml, fine. Display modes, when defined, put a filter in between the path. So okay, the index is the official name of the view. Let me check if this has been overridden in some way through a display mode. So it goes through the list of Boolean conditions you define, and if it finds a match, it picks up a different name. The nice thing is that you don't change your controller code at all. So you, the, the, the core logic of your website doesn't change. And this is uh, just uh, the point that probably everybody is missing. Writing a multi-device website doesn't mean creating multiple sites. You can still have one ASP.NET website with multiple views. And uh, I, in NBC3, where this feature was missing, I wrote myself a similar method. 
and put it in production. In ABC4, fantastic. It's there, it was even better than my home. Let me show you how it works. Okay, let's say that this is the sample code, right? This is the sample project. Uh, let me let me run the project again from scratch. <coughs> Okay, uh, now, the type, the, the code compiled correctly, home index is resolved, and from the index method of the home controller, okay, I just call the regular code I would have used the in a similar situation. So this is my regular code. In the end, I do return model. This is my view model, right? Okay. So the name of the view is the name of the method index. Now, in views, home, I have index, chtml, but I also have index.legacy, index.smartphone, index.tablet. And uh, the trick, the power of display modes is adding the logic that picks up any of this depending on some condition. So now, the logic I have in place just looks at the user agent of the browser. So by default, Internet Explorer sends its own IE11 uh, user agent stream, which is detected, and uh, it, it is mapped to index CSHTML, and index CSHTML, blah, 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 just this phrase, oops, I'm sorry, but uh, this particular website is not supposed to, to work on desktop. So let me see what, let me show you what it, what it changes now when I try to run the website to access the website using a different non-desktop uh, device. I bring up the F12 tool here and I select just a different user agent. I'm just using the F12 developer toolbar to essentially simulate a different browser. So I, I, I'm, what I'm doing here is tell Internet Explorer to present in itself as one of these, as uh, an iPad. So once I click this option, the page will refresh, but now Internet Explorer, by the aspect of this tool, will be sending a different user agent looking to say, hey, look, I'm not, I'm not Internet Explorer, I'm now an iPad. So the code of my site will detect the, user, the incoming user agent to be that of an iPad and reacts properly. So now the UI has changed completely. And this is the, the output of index.tablet.cshtml. So a different view has been picked up. As simply and effective as you have it work having worked for, for, for four years now with responsive web design and CSS media queries. But we, we can do more. If I resize, that's interesting, if I resize the browser window, the view doesn't change. I'm not using responsive web design. So the, the point is, the code of the site is still well aware that the device is an iPad. Regardless, so the, the width of the screen is completely ignored as it should be. 
I mean, as it should be if your purpose is targeting devices. If your purpose is making the appearance of the site as nice as possible with resized windows, that's a different story. So now, if I change again this to be uh, to be to be what uh, Windows Phone, I have a okay. This is a smartphone, and this is a completely different view, slightly different view. But it, it's a, okay. It's a, it's a different CS CS It's a different razor view. It's much easier this way. And uh, if I do yet another step, and I imagine this is even smaller, I pick up a custom string, and in particular, I take this. No, I pick up this one, I think. Yeah, so what I have. What I pick it up is uh, the user agent of my daughter's whole device, which is uh, yeah, still a device capable of accessing the internet, but it has none of the features of a modern smartphone. And for these devices, my app provided an even simpler and nicer adopt view, which is this. And this is the razor view called index legacy .cshtml. So you have full control. You can gain full control over the views while having a single website based on MDC. Um, let me show you now the source code that does the magic. It all starts in a globalized apps where I have a, a call to a custom method called the register display modes. And uh, register display modes. Display config is my class. But uh, display mode provider dot instance dot modes is the internal list of available display modes that you have in MVC. So uh, what I do now is uh, defining uh, for a moment a few display mode, default display mode objects, and then I populate the collection. Uh, I first clear the collection. Uh, I need to do this because by default, there are two display modes predefined. One is called desktop and one is called mobile. This means that without doing anything, if you add to your freshly created NBC 4 or 5 website, two views. One is called, one is index.razor and index.mobile.razor extension. This works automatically as long as uh, the device is recognized to be mobile. The point is how smart is the logic that does device detection. That's the point. And uh, that's precisely what I'm doing here. So a default display mode is essentially an object with two properties. It has a name. We can this one here. It has a name, smartphone, and that is the suffix to be used to differentiate razor views. Okay? So it has to be a unique string. But you are responsible for that string. Uh, and then the context condition. It says, okay, you, and this has to be read like this. You pick up the smartphone specific razor view if this condition returns true. And the Boolean expression is a lambda that takes a HTTP context and returns a Boolean. So by receiving HTTP context, I'm sorry, HTTP context request. Uh, no, actually, HTTP context. So, no, HTTP context. You have a full access to the input data coming with the request. You can access HTTP headers, in particular user agent. You can check queries, um, query parameters. You can check cookies, whatever. 
You can even check the body of the request. So you have full control over the incoming request and can decide intelligently what is the best suited view, razor view, to serve for that request. Uh, and of course, this choice happens only when the view is physically created. So every workflow business logic is run regardless. So this has impact only on the view engine, not on the step that takes to generating the view. So uh, all the logic is run regardless. Okay, uh, just to exemplify here, uh, easy smartphone is an extension method I wrote, it's my code, uh, for, to extend the HTTP request object. And, uh, Uh, is my calls in, it runs into is smartphone internal which receives the user agent string and internally I use this is my choice an external library it's called Burful and this library uh, gets the user agent and gives me back a device object. I device is the type, but it's a type defined in the Woolfolk library. And uh, then with a few extensions, maybe I can implement my logic for recognizing smartphones. So to, to me, for my purposes, a smartphone is a wireless device, not a tablet, support touch, has width at least 240 pixels, and uh, it has, uh, as an operating system, Android at least 2.1, iPhone at least 3.2, Windows Phone at least 7.1, and Blackberry at least 6. But this is my logic. It could be your logic. And this is entirely based on the services, all these methods are services of the Google for Life. Uh, the, the only thing I've done here, which is which, just to make the code even easier to read, is that is wireless and so forth are other extension methods defined on the raw Drupal API. But just to give you an idea of uh, what it means, uh, here is uh, the raw API. So is touch just uh, calls a method called get capability. Because the Drupal API has one method, get capability takes a string and returns a string. Uh, it, it, in ASP.NET, the string true, you want to treat it like a Boolean, or if, if it's a number, you want to treat it like a number. So extension methods just make it easier and cleaner to work with this API. But in the end, this is the code you need, and in particular, from the documentation of the library, uh, the device supports touch if the capability pointing method equals touch string. So in this way, I can gain total full control. Now, uh, to finish off, uh, this library is open source, so it's free for uh, open source projects. It's free, of course, to test it. Before you go to production, you need to come to an agreement, a uh, commercial agreement with a company uh, behind it. It's called the Shantia Mobile. Uh, the great news, news instead is that uh, a few weeks ago, I think the mobile conference, mobile conference in Barcelona uh, uh, a few weeks ago, they announced the free, and this is really free, no strings attached, just free availability of a JavaScript counterpart. So you can get, uh, by just linking a JavaScript file, you can uh, automatically receive, so by simply linking the, the, this URL, you receive a JavaScript object that tells you whether the, the, the browser, which kind of device the browser is. So you, you don't have access to all the capabilities you want, but you know whether it's a smartphone, it's tablet, smart TV, and a few more other things. One or four or five different methods for free. Uh, the JavaScript file is uh, interesting because it enables multi-device UIs, also if you are doing uh, single-page applications. 
but for server side logic, Google for is my de facto standard, and large uh, Facebook uses this. Uh, Google, PayPal, Amazon, or you know, Twitter is the only exception to the rule so far. Uh, but big players use this library in the back. And it, everybody can afford it. So I mean, I used, I've been using this for, for years now. Um, I started as a user, and uh, just to be honest, uh, I'm one of the developers of, of this library, but I started as a user. And, uh, and then I joined uh, the, the, the group of people to maintain uh, it. It's a NuGet package uh, for ASP.NET. Okay, I think that is enough. Uh, yeah, food is ready. Uh, I'll be around uh, today, so feel free to catch me. And also I have a talk on SP identity tomorrow morning. So if you have further questions, uh, don't be shy. Thank you.